And God gave him tablets, and on those tablets were the... The what? Yes, and how many of them were there? Yeah, that's why they're called the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> now, of all those commandments, only one of them really addresses the way we think. Most of them, the rest of them, the other nine, really address actions. You know, no idols, no murder, and, and that sort of thing. But the Tenth Command addresses our attitude, and this is what it says. <clears throat> you will not covet your neighbor's house. You will not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Now, to understand what this command is all about, there, there are a couple things that we need to know. <clears throat> the first one is that in the Bible, the word house can mean the building, like the house of the Lord, or can mean the household. So, for example, when the Bible says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, it doesn't mean as for me and my stucco and tile. Okay? It means the, the household, the, the people. Uh, and so, in this verse... House carries the idea of household, the people. And how do we know that? Well, if you'll look, there's a semicolon after the word house. You will not covet your neighbor's house. In the Old Testament, almost all the verses are divided into two parts, and the two parts are equal. Not in terms of number of words, but in terms of ideas. So house equals everything that comes after the semicolon. So what composes a person's house? Notice, it starts with people. Wife, sons, daughters. Male servants, female servants. Then we get to the things. Oxen, donkeys, anything that is your neighbor's. Now here's why it's so important. When we think of coveting, when we think of being envious and jealous, when we think about possessions, we tend to think only in terms of things that we own. Boats, houses, cars, Xboxes, TVs, stuff like that. The, the, the things that we own. That's what we think of as possessions. But actually, we, we think... You know, People don't just have possessions that are things. People also have, they have well, they have people. Yes. Okay? Like I have a family. Now, I don't think of the possessions like I do, you know, the things that I own. But, but here's why that's so important. Today we're going to look at a passage where there is prosperity. There are possessions, both in terms of people and in terms of things. So if you turn to Genesis chapter 29, we're going to see some of the issues that come from being prosperous, having these things. So we're going to start in Genesis chapter 29, verse 31. To understand what's going on here, we have to know that we've got a guy named Jacob who, you know, one woman is enough. He doesn't just marry two women, they're sisters. We could almost just stop there and just, get, so, but we're going to see what happens as a result of that. So look, beginning in verse 31. The sisters' names are Leah and Rachel. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So one sister is loved by Jacob more than the other. Rachel is loved more than Leah. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. Now, all of these sons are going to have particular names that mean something. And I'll get to all that in a little bit. So verse 33. She conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. She called his name Simeon. Again, she conceived and bore a son and said, now this time my husband will be attached to me. Because I have borne him three sons, therefore his name was called Levi. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. Then she ceased bearing. Now look at verse 1 of chapter 30. When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. She said to Jacob, Give me children or I shall die. Now that's called hyperbole. Will you overstate the case? But we have a marital disagreement here. And I'm sure that those of you who are married don't ever have these. But Jacob makes a mistake, he answers. <laughs> I asked one of our gentlemen who's been married over 60 years, when you speak, are you still wrong? And he said, yes, so we all understand. Uh, so look at what, how Jacob responds. Jacob's anger is kindled against Rachel. And he said, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? Guys, that's not, don't, just don't. Don't. When you're in a hole, just put down the shovel. All you can do is dig it deeper. Just, and so they're, you know, they're, and I assume that they're not saying this calmly and gently to each other. 
So look what she does in verse 3. Then she said, here is my servant Bilhah. Go into her so that she may give birth on my behalf. Now it's really interesting. Many of the details in the Bible no longer have any connection with our lives. But the truths that they teach are eternal. The cause and effect we see is, is the same in every society, in every culture, in every era. And so even though the detail is not the same, that you still see the family strife that's happening here. But in their day, what they would do is they had, well, even today, it's surrogate mothers. And so if a woman could not give birth, she would have one of her servants get impregnated by her husband, but the baby would con be considered hers. This isn't the first time this has happened. His granddad, Abraham, did the same thing. So she says at the end of verse 3 that even I may have children through her. So she gave him her servant Bilhah's wife, and Jacob went into her. And Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Now we have three women, Leah, Rachel, and Bilhah. Then Rachel said, God has judged me and has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore she called his name Dan. Rachel's servant Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, with mighty wrestlings I have wrestled with my sister and have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali. Now verse 8 is very important. She doesn't see herself as having an issue with God, an issue with Jacob. Her issue is with her sister. She says, I've wrestled with my sister because there is jealousy over her sister having all of these sons. So she says, I'm catching up. Now I have two. So verse 9, when Leah saw that she had ceased bearing children, she took her servant Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as wife. Now we have four. Leah, Rachel, Bilhah, and Zilpah. Then Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a son. And Leah said, good fortune has come. So she called his name Gad. Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. And Leah said, happy am I, for women have called me happy. So she called his name Asher. In the days of wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Now in their day, mandrakes were considered an aphrodisiac. In every culture throughout history, there have been foods that people think help to get you in the mood. Yes, your preacher said, get in the mood. It's okay. If that doesn't ever happen, life ends. So they, and so in every, so they thought that, matter of fact, there is a tradition that mandrakes were actually the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So she, he brings home these mandrakes to his mother. So Rachel says to her sister Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. So verse 15, she said to her, is it a small matter you've taken away my husband? Because he loves her more than Leah. Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? Rachel said, then he may lie with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. So now they're fighting over him. By the way, ladies, I don't know there are too many men worth fighting over. <laughs> Look, if he can't decide between you and somebody else, so just, yeah, find a guy that's devoted to you. Verse 16, so when Jacob comes to the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, you must come in to me for I've hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lay with her that night and God listened to Leah and she conceived and bore him a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my wages because uh, I uh, my, gave my servant to my husband, so she called his name Issachar. And Leah conceived again, and she bore Jacob a sixth son. Then Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will honor me, because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. Afterwards, she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah, which will be later in Genesis. Verse 22, then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. She conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. She called his name Joseph, saying, may the Lord add to me another son. Now, we have 11 sons that are born here if you've been keeping count. You probably have heard of the 12 tribes of Israel. So where's the 12th one come in? That's not until Genesis chapter 35. We have Benjamin, and Rachel will actually die uh, giving birth to uh, Benjamin so that gives us the total of 12 because we have 11 and we have one more we have boy it's a miracle some of you ever got out of school if we have 11 and we add one how many do we have 12 now every name means something so we have a chart for you we'll throw it up here on the screen Ray can you ask them to pop the chart up there for us There we go. Now, I expect you to get this very quickly because we don't have it up there very long. Nah, you don't even need to look at it. I have it for you. Like I printed it off. So this chart is out in the foyer on the table. Because if I give it to you right now, you won't hear the rest of the sermon. You'll just be looking at the chart and go, hey, I got scratch paper. Now, I know how it's going to go. You're going to pick one up when you leave. Fold it 
put it in your pocket, your Bible, your purse, the back seat of your car, but it's okay. Around November, you'll discover it again. All right, so this is all 12 sons, who the moms are, their birth order, the verse where they were born, and what their name means. So if you want to know what their names mean, then here they are. So just grab your handy-dandy chart on your way out today, and uh, you'll have all of these sons put together and in order. So we have 11 sons uh, that are born here to four different women. Now, there are a number of things I want us to see as we look at this. The first one is the jealousy in these verses, the envy, the strife, the problems have nothing to do with material possessions. It has to do with relationships, just like we find in the 10th of the Ten Commandments. Jealous of someone else's marital relationship, covet their wife. Jealous of their kids, sons and daughters. Jealous of their extended relationships, their male servants, their female servants. So, so what we have here in these verses is a lot of conflict that's the result of envy over someone else's family relationships. Go back to 30 verse 1. The first verse of chapter 30 says, when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. She's envious of her sister's family. And then when she has a couple of sons through her maidservant, Bilhah, verse 8, she says, I have prevailed with my sister. In other words, oftentimes we see what someone else has, not in terms of their material possessions, but we see what they have in terms of relationships and become jealous of them. And let me tell you, this starts early. People are jealous. Girls get jealous because another girl's prettier. Or the boy likes that girl instead of me. Or guys are like, well, I, you know, I'm a nerd, not a jock, so I'm not popular. Nobody says amen because nobody's got part of the nerd. Just remember this, athletic ability disappears over time. But nerdness lasts forever. <laughs> so, so they, but there's this envy of someone else, their athletic ability, their looks, their popularity, their personality. Everybody seems to be drawn to them. Everybody seems to ignore you. I mean, it starts early in life that we become envious and jealous of what someone else has just in terms of who they are. Or we become jealous of their relationships. Boy, I wish I had a wife like that. Man, I wish my wife would look at me. I wish my children would treat me with that kind of respect. Now, if you say that to someone, here's what they hear. I've never seen your kids at home. If you say to someone, your children are so well behaved, what you hear is, I've never seen your children home. Because in reality, on the way to church, they weren't in the car with you and this is what you got back. See, oh, 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 please, Dad, no, no, don't let them see me riding with you. I, could, so I had a kid in college that I picked up one day to take to lunch, hopped in the car and stuck their head down in the floorboard. I said, what are you doing? I don't want anybody to see you picking me up because I drove this giant conversion van for years. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I guess like, you know, it's like, oh man, I, I, I'm, you know, I wish I had a dad that was cool. Okay, first of all, there are no dads that are cool. There's nobody, I've never, ever, ever, ever met like a 15 year old goes, man, my dad's the coolest dude on the planet. So if you think you're going to be the cool dad, just quit, Forget, just give up. I don't care if you were the stud athlete, you're now just a nerd. You've crossed over and joined us, become one of us. And so, you know, they, they haven't seen all this, but, but we look at someone and go, boy, I wish my family was like that. I wish I had those rights. I wish people liked me like that. I wish I had a sense of humor so that people would laugh at me like they laugh at that person. It's astounding how we look at someone else and become envious of what they have in terms of their personality or in terms of their relationships or in terms of their family. And so what we have here, interestingly enough, is the strife is as a result of envy within the family. You know, not everybody can be Mufasa. Some of us have to be Uncle Scar. Some of us have to get the shallow end of the gene pool. Some of us, man, man, my, my brother, my sister, they got all the talent. They got all the looks. They got all the, they got all the whatever it is. And I kind of sort of got the leftovers. And we become jealous of our own family. We become envious. There's, there's strife within a family because we think that, that man, if we, could, if we could be like them or be like that person. And so here's what I want us to do today as we think about how, how the friction that was caused here as, as we look at this family and all the dynamics of what they had in terms of children. I want you to take out your phone or stop playing bubbles or whatever it is that you're doing I know you're multitasking but for, just for a second I want you to pull out your phone no take out your phone 
Now, for the 2% of you Americans who do not have a smartphone, I know you carry a pen and paper because you don't have a smartphone, so you can write it down if you want to. But for the other 98%, take out your phone and pull up your Note app, whatever it is that you use. I use Google Keep, but whatever you use, pull out your Note app or if you've got an office thing in it. This is what we're going to have you put in. Okay. Now, don't put your spouse's name if they're sitting next to you. I want you to put down the name of your family member who you find to be the most irritating. <laughs> it could be your brother, your sister, brother-in-law, mother-in-law, father-in-law, sister-in-law, someone like that, son-in-law, daughter-in-law, it doesn't matter who it is, you got someone to put down. Now, some of you are thinking, can I put more than one? Okay, no, let's just stick with one, shall we? Just the one in your family that feel, you just feel like they create the most tension. It, now, it may be you, and if your family members were here, your name is the one they would put down. This is why I don't, you know, now, now, I work on my sermons for like three weeks out, and y'all do know that preachers really don't preach to people. We preach to ourselves and let everybody else listen in. So I thought, man, this is a great sermon illustration. I'm gonna have everybody pull out their phone, put down the name, you know, they're going to put down their sister, their, you know, their stepmom, whoever it is that they just, I mean, really gets under their skin. They don't even like the thought of this, that's seen this now, their name. I mean, I'm going to tell them to pray for them. And then I was, wait a second. That means I got to put a family member down. And you know what my first thought was? I put the second most irritating because they're easier to pray for. Oh, don't look at me. Now, for those of you who are hyper holy, who get along with everybody in the whole wide world, and you're loved by everybody, just ignore this. But I'm talking to all of us that are normal Christians. All right, there's somebody in your family who just is irritating. I, I, I mean, I asked, I asked my wife after the first service, who'd you put? She said, probably the same person you did. <laughs> So at least we agree. Uh, and so just, just think, put their name, and this one, I want you to pray for them because you know what? It's really hard to dislike someone you're praying for. Do you know one of the main things that's missing in this text? Instead of Rachel going to God and praying and pouring out her heart to God, she turns her anger toward Jacob as though somehow it's his fault that Leah is having babies and she's not. The sisters see this as a friction between them rather than praying for one another. If they would have gone to their knees and prayed for each other and prayed that God would bless the whole family, we wouldn't have these chapters in the Bible. But we do because they're, they're, the friction is caused because of him. So just think of the person and, and some of you are going to find this very, very difficult. But I challenge you, pray for them. Pray for them. And I want to challenge you to, to do what, what I've done the last couple weeks. Pray for the most irritating. Not the one that's slightly irritating, but you can still pray for them. I mean like the one that you find that you may have never prayed for positively. Now when we think about possessions, some of the problems, we only think about things. And so this passage not only tells us about relationships, it also talks about things. The stuff. Look at verse 25. As soon as Rachel had born Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, Send me away that I may go to my own home and country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you, that I may go, for you know the service that I have given you. But Laban said to him, If I have found favor in your sight, I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Name your wages and I will give it. So up to this point, Jacob has worked years and years and years, 14 just to get his wives. Jacob's worked for, for a couple of decades for free, basically. He doesn't own any of this. It all belongs to his father-in-law. So verse 29, Jacob said to him, you, know, you yourself know how I've served you and how your livestock has fared with me. For you had little before I came and it has increased abundantly and the Lord has blessed you wherever I turned. But now when shall I provide for my own household also? It's time for me to earn some for myself, he says. So verse 31, he said, what shall I give you? Jacob said, you will not give me anything. If you will do this for me, I will again pasture your flock and keep it. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from it every speckled and spotted sheep and every black lamb and the spotted and speckled among the goats and they will be my wages. So my honesty will answer for me later when you come look in, into my wages with you. Everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs, if found with me, shall be counted stolen. Laban said, good, let it be as you have said. So they enter into a business arrangement. Now, I told you the details are different, but the principles remain the same. Guess what? We have a guy who's a crooked business person. 
And that unfortunately has not changed either. So look at what he does in verse 35. But that day Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted. Every one that had white on it, every lamb that was black and put them in the charge of his sons. Tried to swindle his own son-in-law. He set a distance of three days journey between himself and Jacob and Jacob pastured the rest of Laban, Laban's flock. Then Jacob took fresh sticks of poplar and almond and plane trees and peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white of the sticks. He set the sticks that he had peeled in front of the flocks and the troughs, that is, the watering places where the flocks came to drink. And since they bred when they came to drink, the flocks bred in front of the sticks, and so the flocks brought forth striped, speckled, and spotted. So here's what he did. This isn't some kind of weird ancient magic thing. We put the sticks up that caused the animals to mate, so he only put the sticks in front of the spotted and the speckled so that they would mate and produce... You can say it with boldness. Spotted and speckled. Let's say that together. It, spotted and speckled. So he just does good animal husbandry here. So verse 40, Jacob separated the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the striped and all the black in the flock of Laban. He put his own droves apart and did not put them with Laban's flock. Whenever the stronger of the flock were breeding, Jacob would lay the sticks in the troughs before the eyes of the flock that they might breed among the sticks. But for the feebler of the flock, he would not lay them there. So the feebler would be Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. Thus the man increased greatly and had large flocks, female servants and male servants and camels and donkeys. <clears throat> now we tend to evaluate wealth in terms of dollars. Someone's worth X number of dollars. But in the ancient world, wealth was determined by flocks and fields. So Jacob is a very wealthy man because not only does he have all these flocks, but he has so many he's actually had to hire some employees, some female servants and male servants, and then he's bought some other animals besides the goats and the sheep. He's also bought camels and donkeys. So he's become extremely wealthy, even though Laban has attempted uh, to swindle him. Now, <clears throat> I want us to, to grasp wealth and what we think about wealth and how interesting it is, the whole approach to wealth. There's been a lot of discussion over the last year or so about the 1%. The 1%, the wealthy 1%. According to Oxfam, which is a conglomerate of at least 20 worldwide charitable organizations, of the world's population, to be the top 1% of wage earners in the world, you have to make $32,400. $32,400 makes you a part of the 1%. What that means is I'm looking at a lot of people this morning who are in the top 1% of wealth in the world. Now you think, man, 32,400, that doesn't strike me as being rich. Well, that's because we don't define it that way. According to Pew Research, in order to qualify as middle class in the United States of America, you have to make $42,000 a year. So everyone in the United States classified as middle class are some of the richest people in all of the world. In other words, I'm standing this morning in church full of filthy rich people. Now you don't feel that way. I've never had someone come up to me and go, yeah, I just got a raise. Making 36 this year. Man, am I rich. I just don't know what I'm going to do with all that. I mean, we don't define it that way. The opposite end is we don't define poverty the way, the way the world does. We have no poor people in America. Here's how the world defines poverty. Tomorrow, I hope to find a trash can with enough food in it left over to feed myself and my family. But in all likelihood, one of us is not going to eat. No one this morning got up got online to see how many thousands of children died of starvation last night in the Phoenix area. None of us are sitting this morning thinking every few seconds there's a kid around here who's dying because they starved to death. That's how the world defines poverty. We don't define it that way. The world looks at us, you know what the world says? You are ridiculously rich. Ridicu see, here's the thing about the stuff that we own. We define wealth by what we don't have. See, the world looks at us and says, you're all wealthy in America. And I think it's an incredible thing that God has blessed us the way that he has. 
Apparently, y'all don't think so. You're ready to just give it all away and go live in a cardboard box. I think it's incredible that God has blessed us as he has. And I think he has called on us to share that with a world that's in need and is hurting. Now, among Christians who've been called to sacrifice, to deny themselves, to minister to other people, I should get a whole bunch of amens. God has blessed us in order that we might minister to a world that's hurting. And so, you know, the world looks at us. That's one of the reasons, by the way, why the world hates America. Because they're envious of the wealth that God has given us. And it's astounding that so many people who live in the upper 1% of wealth in our world are envious of people who are wealthier. I wish I was rich. How do we find rich? Having a lot more stuff than I have now. I guarantee there's nobody in here that can't go home today and find stuff you don't need. How do I know that? Because it's in the same box in the back of the same closet as you put it there years ago. You got tons of stuff you don't need. And it just kind of, it doesn't get moldy here, thank goodness, but it just sits back there. I mean, it, it's amazing how we think that, that in terms of stuff that somebody that has more than me. Laban is a wealthy man. He owns flocks and herds. The Bible tells us, even Jacob said, wherever I've gone, the Lord has blessed you with more. And yet Laban is still jealous and envious. Do you know why? Because of attitude. Some people have an attitude that someone else has more than me because they have better relationships than I do. Other people have an attitude of envy because somebody else has more things than I have. But both of them express the wrong kind of attitude. See, it always comes down to this. Do you have your possessions or do your possessions have you? See, if your possessions have you, your goal is to live for more. But if you have your possessions, you realize that you have more to live for. If your possessions have you, you're willing to sacrifice your family for more. But if you have your possessions, then you sacrifice for your family. If your possessions have you, you discover temporary happiness. But if you have your possessions, you have eternal happiness. If your possessions have you, you are defeated by setbacks. But if you have your possessions, you persevere through your setbacks in the joy of Jesus Christ. If your possessions have you, your hope is in Wall Street. But if you have your possessions, your hope is in Golden Streets. If your possessions have you, money. Money is most important, but if you have your possessions, the Messiah is most important. If possessions have you, your finances define you, but if you have your possessions, forgiveness defines you. If possessions have you, cash gives you personal worth, but if you have your possessions, it's Christ who gives you your personal worth. If your possessions have you, getting higher is your goal, but if you have your possessions, humility is your goal. If possessions have you, you brag about your salary, but if you have your possessions, you brag about your Savior. If possessions have you, you'll step on people. But if you have your possessions, you will serve people. If possessions have you, you find security in your savings account. But if you have possessions, if you have your possessions, you find your security in your salvation. If possessions have you, gold is king. But if you have your possessions, God is your king. If possessions have you, you find that jewels bring you joy. But if you have your possessions, you discover that Jesus brings you joy. In this passage, if Laban and Leah and Rachel and all of them would have recognized that God's the one who brings security and joy, stop being jealous of what everybody else has. They wouldn't have had all this strife and conflict. They wouldn't have had all these problems. Yes, the details are different. We don't define wealth by ox and donkeys. Somebody give me an amen right here. We don't define our wealth by that, but we still have the same problems they did jealousy and envy and family strife and coveting what other people have in relationships and in possessions man it shouldn't be this way see if you really want to get a grip on your possessions make sure that Jesus is number one in your life he's number one you want to get a grip on your relationships make sure that Jesus is number one in your life so the answer to all the strife and problems in this passage are not more the answer is Jesus and then that puts all the possessions in a proper context. Matter of fact, that puts everything in life in a proper context when Jesus is number one. Our Heavenly Father, I know we live in a different world that's miles away from where this happened and centuries away from when it happened. And yet, as human beings, we face the same things. Crooked business dealings, 
family problems and strife and dissension, jealousy, and envy, coveting. Lord, I pray that you would give us victory, that you would help us to always keep Jesus as number one in our lives, to follow him above and beyond all else. Lord, please help us not to allow possessions to get us and to control us, but Lord, help us to put Jesus first so that we know how to handle and control our possessions. For it is in his name that we pray, amen.